Okay, uh, let's get into the sermon. So I'll just... Uh, I'll try not to preach. I don't think I'm preaching too long today, but you never know. I always think like my sermon's really short, but then it goes, goes longer than I think. Now, today, um, let me just turn to my first passage. It's in 1 Kings. <clears throat> Kings, first Kings, number two. Now today, today I'm not talking about the Trinity, right? Not so, not a sermon about the Trinity today. Um, I've had enough Trinity for the week. <laughs> I need to take, I'll take, I'll take a couple of weeks break from the Trinity topic, but um, not talking about the Trinity today. Today I'm preaching on a totally unrelated topic, um, and the title of the sermon is Four Traits, Four Traits, you know, virtues or characteristics, Four Traits of a Faithful Man. So I preached on the virtuous woman, gave the women a bit of a hard time. Um, so I'm preaching on, on the men today and um, four traits of a faithful man that I just wanted to, to pick up on here. So, you know, what does it mean to be a man, right? Uh, you know, the world has an idea of what manliness is, right? The world's got their idea of what manliness is. Um, and that's, it's the total opposite of what God sees as manliness, Right? Because what does the world see as manliness? When you think about some, like before you got saved, right? Or, you know, you know, if you know like ungodly people, you know, like people that don't have anything to do with church, don't care about the things of God, what, what do you think the world thinks when they glorify, oh man, that guy's really manly, that guy's, you know, this man. I'm thinking of my days back in high school, you know, my days back in uni or even in the workplace. You think of people that are like fornicators. Like that's, that to the world, that's a manly attribute, isn't it? Somebody that, oh, you know, they get all the chicks, they're sleeping around, being a whoremonger. Um, that's not manliness. You know, that's sin in God's eyes. That's despicable uh, for somebody to be a fornicator or a whoremonger. But the world glorifies that, don't they? The world sees that as manliness. Man, oh, this guy's getting all the chicks. That's not what, how God sees it. God sees that person as a whoremonger. And that's how I see it as well. Like, I'm not impressed when somebody tells me how many girls they've been with. Like, I'm not impressed, you know, when somebody tells me, you know, oh, you know, all these girls or whatever. I think it's disrespectful. I think it's, they, they don't value women. They don't value people's, you know, sisters and daughters. You know, they're just terrible. Um, or somebody maybe, they might see manliness as somebody who's a brawler, right? Somebody who's really tough and, oh, they're, they're going to let everyone know, like, well, they, you know, what, you know, you, you know tell me, I'm going I'm to deck you, I'm going to punch your face and I'm going to drop you or whatever. The world sees that as manliness. But is that manliness in God's eyes? No, that's just a brawler. That's, just, that's, just, that's what children do, you know? <laughs> like, like children, you know, when they get upset, they're like, ah, you know, they don't punch or whatever. But that, that's what kids do, right? Because when they can't reason, they can't just talk with people and be an adult, they just go to blows, right? That's not how God sees manliness. Or what about a drunkard? You know, what about men that show off how much they can drink and how much they can take, like, you know, and, and just get smashed and they just, oh, you know, I got so smashed on the weekend and, you know, just, just showing off how much they can drink and how much, you know, what, whatever they do in the partying and the clubbing. That's what the world sees as manliness. That's not what God sees as manliness. Now, let's look at this verse in 1 Kings 2. It says here in uh, uh, verse 1, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying... So we see David on his deathbed, and he's got his last words that he's saying to Solomon. And he says, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Right? So he says to, to Solomon, his son, he's about to die. And one thing he wants to tell him is, hey, Solomon, be a man. You know, show yourself a man. That means you're an example, right? So it's not just you're a man, but you're a man that's an example. People can see you're a man, right? And you're a strong person. And obviously back here as well, it's talking about the strength as well, but also mentally, right? A man ought to be mentally strong because he ought to be a leader. But see, it's not just be a man, like I'm saying, in the world's sense, because he goes on to say in verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God. So you see, being a man is not about being ungodly and impressing the world. It's about keeping the commandments of God and being a man in God's eyes. And what, how, what does God see a man? To walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. So we see that true manliness, 
is linked in with godliness, isn't it? If you want to be a man, be godly. You know, you don't want to be a man, just show your friends you're all tough, show your friends how cool you are. No, you want to show God how godly you are, and then you'll show yourself a real man in God's eyes. So what are four traits? I'll just, I'll just go through four in my sermon that I've sort of picked out. Obviously, this is not an extensive list of what it means to be a man, but just some I wanted to, uh, you know, talk to you about today. So number one, number one, I'll go to Proverbs 20, verse 6, is faithfulness. A characteristic of a godly man is a faithful man, right? Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man, who can find? What's that verse saying? That's saying that every guy thinks they're great. Every guy thinks they're the bee's knees, right? Every guy thinks that they're, gift, they're God's gift to the world. But a real man, a faithful man, who can find? It reminds me of in Proverbs 31, I mentioned this one, you know, uh, you know a, a virtuous woman, her price is far above rubies. Who can find a virtuous woman, right? For her price is far above rubies. Why? Because it's rare. It's a rare thing. It's not normal. It, it's not... Uh, uh, what's the word like it's not uh, um, common for, for a man to be a faithful man right that's why it takes work it takes somebody to actually purpose in their heart to be faithful right it, it's, it's a rare thing to find somebody that is faithful and what do you think of when you think of faithfulness you think of somebody that is trustworthy somebody that's reliable right somebody that has integrity meaning when they say something they're going to do it right? They say they're going to be on time. They're on time. They say they're going to get it done. They get it done. And when they get it done, they do a good job. This is faithfulness. Uh, diligence, right? So it's like pro being proactive, taking initiative. I want to show you, if you actually look up the word faithful in the Bible, it's a really interesting um, verse that is the first verse that is mentioned. It's in Numbers 12, 7. Um, no, I hope I can get there. Numbers 12. I can't get numbers. There we go. Um, Numbers 12, verse 7. My servant Moses is not so, right? I, 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 we don't have the comment, but it's talking about you know, Moses and all that sort of stuff. But I'm, just, I'm just focused on this verse there. He says, my, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. So when you look up, the, it's interesting that you look up the word faithful. Moses is the first person that is called faithful in the Bible. Um, and, and why is that? And, and obviously, I'm not being dogmatic on this, but just my thoughts are, because when you read through the Old Testament and you read through the building of the tabernacle, the building of, of, of all the instruments and things like that, you keep seeing this phrase come up again about Moses that when it says, um, you know, he did as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses. It's like they're doing things as the Lord commanded Moses. And I sort of get this idea that Moses made sure things were done as God commanded him, right? That's why he was faithful because God said, build this and told him this is how it should look and Moses made sure it was done how God told him to do it. So he was a faithful servant because God asked him to do it, God commanded him and he kept God's commandments. Uh, look at Joshua. Joshua. Let me just see if I can use the word Joshua. I don't know all the shortcuts uh, for this program yet. There we go. Look at this. As the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. So again, that faithfulness that he's transmitting that message that God commanded him to do something and he's making sure it's getting done by commanding it to Joshua. And so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So we see here that Joshua also was a faithful man. He made sure that he did things properly, diligently, reliably, trustworthily. Uh, let's go to Matthew. So we'll just ha have a quick look at the parable of the pounds and talents. I won't go through the parables. I'll just focus in on a couple of verses in these parables. But at the end of the parable of the talents, we see here, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so that he had received five talents, came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So what I just want to show here, you see how these servants, think about their call, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Why are they faithful? Because they were given the talents. 
the Lord went away so they don't need to be watched all this time and nagged all the time and supervised all the time. They're faithful because he can go away. They get to work. They're productive. They're profitable. And then when the Lord comes back, they've doubled their talents. And he's like, hey, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because they're doing what he's commanded them to do even when he's not there. Right? Faithfulness. Um, Luke 19, just uh, comparing this passage to uh, the parable of ten. This is the parable of the pounds. And he says here, he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. Right? Now, occupy is not like occupy, you know, George Street, occupy Wall Street, where they just, they're just there, right? They're loitering. That's not occupy George Street. That's loitering George Street. Occupy means like occupation, right? Where you're actually working. So he's saying, he's, the Lord's going away and he's saying, work till I come back. So you see, that's that faithfulness of, I'm giving you a task to do. I've commanded you to do something just like we have. This applies to us. God has given us a great commission to do, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he wants us to be a faithful servant. He wants a, he's gone away. He's going to come back. And is he going to say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Occupy till I come. Uh, Luke 16, verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And what I want to show here is that if you are faithful in the small things, that will lead to being entrusted with larger things. And it's the same in the kingdom of God. It's the same at church. It's the same in your job. This principle goes throughout life. That if you do the small things faithfully, then you will be entrusted with more things. And this is the principle we're seeing here, that if you are faithful in that which is least. Remember, we saw that in the parable of the talents too, that he's been faithful over a little things, just making that five talents into five talents more. And what did, how did God reward them? God rewarded them by saying, hey, be thou over you know, oh, you know, they, well, yeah, they were wrong. In, in the parable of the pound, sorry, it says, you know, be thou over five cities, right? So they've just multiplied some money, right, from one to five, and, and now they are given authority over five cities, right? That's, that's, a, huge, that's a huge difference, right? So you, 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 you change your portfolio from 1,000 to 10,000, and then you meet God, and he's like, you know what? have 10 cities to look after, you know, just because you were faithful in lease. It's the same in our spiritual life. You know, what you do for God here is how you're going to be rewarded. And we're all given different. And if you're faithful with what you've done, God will entrust to you the true riches. He'll give you more in heaven. And we get an idea from the parable of the pounds and talents what, what the sort of magnification or multiplication is. So this principle applies not only spiritually in, in, in heavenly things, but in your job as well. Like if you're the sort of worker that is just like, you know, your boss asks you to take out the trash and you're just like, oh, like, you know, I want to take it. That's not my job. That's like, that's below my pay grade. Or, you know, you, you know, they get you to just do some simple task and you just make it so hard for them. And, you know, you're like, oh, that's not my job. I'm not paid to do those things. That's probably why you're not getting a promotion. You know, that's probably why you, you, your boss doesn't want, you know, you, your boss doesn't want to give you a reference and encourage the next boss to give you the job because you make it so hard for them. How can they, you know, encourage the next boss to, that, that you're a good worker and say anything about you? So think about this in your life. When you have a small task to do, don't have the attitude of, ah, oh, it's just, you know, make it so hard for them. Because if you're faithful in the small things, those are the people that, are then faithful in larger things. You know, your, your boss trusts you to, to send that email, to take out the rubbish. They're going to let you run whatever that other thing. And, you know, when, when you start managing people as well, that's how it works in life. So, you know, I always, when, when I work and there's something small to do, I always see it as an opportunity to show my faithfulness, right? So that they can, they, they trust me. And then that way, when they ask, when I have an opportunity to do something else, you know, I've got that edge on it. So that's number one, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Let's go on to the next attribute. Next attribute, 1 Corinthians 6. So we're talking about four traits of a faithful man, obviously faithfulness. The second one is the obvious one, is your appearance. 
right? If you're going to show yourself a man, you've got to look like a man, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're going to show yourself a man, but people look at you and you look a bit girly, you know, you've got I don't know, long hair and you're wearing pink and all. And obviously these are my opinions, right? Uh, you know, wearing pink and flower. You know, if you're wearing like a fla flowery shirt that's a bit tight, I mean, you're not really showing yourself a man, in my opinion. But this is something we've got to think about, right? If we're going to show, if we need to be manly, we need to look manly as well. We need, we need to present ourselves as being a man and not being all soft and girly. You know, that's why it's, you, don't, you don't want to necessarily be a man that has like really girly hand movements. You know, sometimes you, you see people and, you know, you know, you know, they're not a homo or anything, but then, you know, they, they're sort of so effeminate that you're kind of thinking like, I don't really know whether this guy's a homo or not because he, the way he talks and the way he acts and the way he reacts, like, you know, it's like, that's like, that's girly, right? So... Men should not be doing that. Men should be behaving themselves as a man, presenting themselves as a man, not as a girl. Because let's have a look at this passage here in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, that it is actually a sin for a man to be girly. Right? Now, I'm not dogmatic on what I define as girly, right? Because that, that we are not necessarily told um, specifics. But we do know that if a man is girly, that is a sin. Right? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, drunk, nor drunkards, revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So the one I just want to focus on in this verse here, it says, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. So what, what does it mean to be effeminate? Effeminate is when you're a man, but you're being feminine. Because obviously for a girl to be feminine, that's a good thing. It's not good for a girl to be too masculine, right? But for a man, it's a sin for him to be effeminate, to be girly. So it's not just, oh, you know, he's just a little bit different. You know, he's just a little bit, you know, off the deep end, you know, in how he acts. No, 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 it's, 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 it's something that God has commanded us that as men, we ought to be manly, not effeminate. So it is a sin. It's a sin to be for a man to be girly. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, 14, and just show you here. It says in 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, what this verse is teaching, is not teaching that women cover their hair and wear a bonnet. People are not are totally misunderstanding 1 Corinthians 11. It's not that women have to cover their head. Their covering is their hair. That's their glory. That, that, and and you, you know, like if a girl does her hair up, it makes her very beautiful, right? The way she does her hair. But that's a feminine attribute. It's a feminine attribute for your hair to make you beautiful, for your hair to be all nice. If, if you look at a guy and you think, man, that guy's got really nice flowing hair. That, that's girly, right? That's, 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 uh, that's a shame, the Bible says, that this man has long hair. It's not something he ought to be proud of. It's something he ought to have shame about. Now, what this verse doesn't say, and this is what I just want to clear up on this verse, it doesn't say that it's a sin for a man to have long hair, right? It says it's a shame unto him. That's different to a sin. Why? Because in the, in the Old Testament, there was the Nazarite vow, where you know they would afflict themselves and they wouldn't wouldn't uh, take you know wine or grapes and things like that and they would let their hair grow long this is why samson had long hair right because samson was a, a special prophet in that he was going to be a nazarite from his birth right and you remember after he cut his hair he lost his strength and all that sort of stuff so obviously this is why i take this position right because if it was a sin for a man to have long hair then it would be a sin for God to have a Nazarite vow where they're meant to grow their hair long. Does that make sense? Right? So it doesn't say here that it's a sin for a man to have long hair. It's a shame unto a man to have long hair. But this is why as men, it's a bit feminine to have long hair in the sense that if, if, if you're growing your hair long to, 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 for it to be some crown for you, some covering for you, then that is a sin because you're being effeminate. But it doesn't mean that it's a sin just the fact that somebody has long hair because they would have the Nazarite vow where they are afflicting themselves. They're, they're showing their shame, right? They're showing that, they're, they're, they, that they are letting themselves go for this Nazarite vow. Um, and that's, that's the purpose of why they would let their hair grow long because it's not something they would normally do, right? It's like when they would put sackcloth and ashes, 
right? They're sort of showing that they're mourning and they're afflicting themselves. That's why I think that the Nazarite vow has the long hair and that's why it says shame, it doesn't say sin, because it would be a, it'd be a contradiction if it was a sin for a man to have long hair and then there's a Nazarite vow. Um, where was I? So appearance, you want to look manly. Don't look girly. Don't, don't you know, have your hair all girly, you know, long hair, um, girly hair. Um, and last one, let's go to 1 Timothy 2, verse 9, uh, is your clothing. It says here, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold, or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So you say here, well, that doesn't say anything about men. You know, it's talking about how women should dress. That's my point, right? My point is that when, when the Bible gives instruction to, to tell people modest apparel, it's to women, right? Because it's a feminine thing for women to want to dress up all nice and be focused on their clothing and things like that. It's not, it's not a ma masculine attribute. It's an effeminate attribute for a man to want to adorn himself, to want to beautify himself with his clothing. So we want to show ourselves a man, you know, we want to be manly. We, you know, we want to, you know, want to, we want to be groomed, right? So that we're not ashamed. Uh, and so that we can, you know, we can at least pray to God in the church because that is a sin. If you have long hair and you pray to God in the church, that is a sin, right? When you pray publicly, right? Not, not privately. Um, that's why if somebody has long hair, they'll, nev they'll never pray up here for the church because I don't want to dishonor the head, which is Jesus Christ, right? So, um, and clothing. So faithfulness, faithful man is faithful, looks, looks like a man. Let's go on to the next one. Number three, let's go to Acts 5, verse 1. Now, whenever I think of this one, so number three is being a hard worker. Being a hard worker is a masculine attribute. It's a, it's a trait of a faithful man, right? Because we talked about you know, occupy till I come. He's working hard while the, the guy's gone. So he's not just working, but he's working hard, right? Um, now, whenever I think of working hard, I always think of this passage in Acts 5, right? Um, where the, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, when they, when they lied about how much they gave to church, but they, they didn't actually give. They said they were going to give it all, but they didn't. Um, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. So she knew secretly what they were doing. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what this passage, I just want to be clear, this passage is not teaching that they had to give all the land. The, the, the reason why they were struck dead is because they told everyone that they, they sold the property and they told everyone we had given it all, but they didn't, right? So let's say you, today you sold a house for $500,000, um, but you told everybody that you sold it for $400,000 just so you could get the glory that you, you gave it all, right? But you actually kept 100000 of it. That's pretty much what they've done. They've kept back part of the price. The wife also knew too, but then they brought it basically saying that, hey, we'd given everything. Um, but Peter said, Adonis, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? See, look, whilst it remained, what is it, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? But thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So you see here, he's saying, like, they didn't have to, right? They, they could have just said, you know, we sold the property, but we're only giving half. But that's not what they did, right? They lied saying that they gave it all when they didn't. Um, verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, right? So he died instantly. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. So what happened? They lied, and instantly God killed them, right, in that moment. So that shows that, you know, that's, it's not that they lost their salvation. Probably, probably they're saved, right? But God can punish somebody to the point where he takes your life, you know? So it's not that God is just punishing you because, you know, you're ostracized at work or you, know, you made a bad financial decision. God, the, part of God's chastisement also is death. He can, he can give you, he can do things to you um, that take away your life. You know, that's why we ought to have fear of God, not just reverence him, but also fear of what he will do to us if the, his chastisement comes to us. Um, all that to say this, sorry, just to say anything, but uh, this, this is what I'm getting to about hard working. But look at this. So Ananias just lied. He's dead, right? He just died. You can imagine somebody's just dead here. But in the next breath, it says, And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. 
So what I always get from this passage is, you know, the young men in church, they ought to be the workers, right? They ought to be the hard workers. Well, I, I don't like it when I see in churches when all the work is going on and it's all the ladies doing the work. You know, it's all the, it's all the ladies that are, you know, they're wiping down the tables, putting away everything, they're getting everything ready. I, I mean, that's not the example we see in the New Testament, right? Yeah, we see women working, but look at when, when something needs to get done, that's hard to do. The young men just get up and they get it done, right? The young men aren't just standing around, talking, you know, chilling out while everyone else, all the ladies are doing work, right? As young men, as men in this church, we ought to be hardworking, right? We ought to be the example. We ought to be the leaders. Show women, hey, we work hard too. We're hard workers, right? Not that we're the slack ones and then they're doing all the hard work. So they didn't have to be told. They just got up. The young men arose. Wound up. And look, this is a bit of a job, right? It's, I know it's just in one passage. It's just in one verse. This is the young men arose, wound him up, right? So they went and tied him up, carried him out and buried him. Right? So I don't know whether that means they went out and had to go dig a, dig a grave right, to put him in there and, and, and bury him. And it was about the space of three hours after. Right? So this is three hours later right, that they're taking to go and bury this guy and, and whatever. When his wife, not knowing what was done, came in and Peter answered unto her and said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. So she lies as well. And Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So I just, every time I read that passage, I just think like, oh, these, these young men are great, right? Like it's almost like they, don't, they didn't complain. They just like went in there, just got it done. And but you can kind of picture it. It's kind of funny because it's like Ananias has just died, right? And then, you know, they, they take him out, they wound him up, they bury him. And remember, it says, and three hours later, Sapphira comes. So that means, like, they just got back from burying Ananias, right? And then it's like, oh, now Sapphira's dead, and then they go and bury her. So it almost took, like, three hours. Like, they went out, bound him up, <laughs> buried him. They just get back, and Peter says, well, you know what? The people that just buried your husband, they just got back, and they're going to bury you. <laughs> Anyways, I just think that's a, it's a funny story. But what I'm getting at is hard working. We have to be hard working as men. Work hard. Faithfulness, appearance, hard working. Let's uh, have a look at a couple of other passages just in regards to hard working. Uh, this is in 1 Timothy 5. So this is talking about providing financially for your house, you know, that the church ought to take care of the widows and the elders, and, you know, that includes the bishops and, and, uh, and the deacons. <clears throat> uh, not, not, not that elders are deacons. I'm just saying that, you know, you'd have workers in church like bishops and deacons. But it also make, gives this principle, right? Because it talks about that if the church is not able, if, if, if a widow has sons or you know, family ought to take care of those widows, right? Because there's a responsibility so that the church is not charged with that. But it makes this passage in, in verse 8. It says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. See, a husband or a father that is not providing for his house, the Bible says that that person is worse than an unbeliever, right? Because we, we have a responsibility as men to make sure our houses are provided for, that our children are fed and they have somewhere to live. Hey, stop playing you two, okay? And pay attention. Well, my wife's not here because Abel and, um, Abel and Sarah are sick, so she's at home, she's on the phone, but that's why I don't have um, somebody pinching these guys every time they're playing around up here. Um, so it's a we have a responsibility, and I'm not saying that if times get tough, right, and then, you know, you know men, they're trying to work hard and they're not making ends meet, that's not what I'm getting at. It's, it's, the, it's the lazy ones. It's the ones that they have the responsibility, they're not getting it done. And you see that in some cultures where, you know, it's, the mum is, is forced to go out and get a job, you know, you know, while the husband is just slacking off and getting drunk and whatnot. That he's, the Bible, that, that's what the Bible's describing, that that man is not manly, he's not a faithful man, and he's worse than an unbeliever. He's worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible's describing here. Uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians uh, 3, 6. Well, we see here that uh, Paul is now, uh, you know, talking about being a hard worker and rebuking those that are not working hard. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walk, walketh disorderly. Right? 
and he's going to go into what he means by this disorderly behavior and not after the tradition which he, which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So he's saying, you know how to behave because you saw me. You saw what sort of worker I was, and this is how I want people. We didn't behave ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. So you see here that Paul, even though Paul could go to the Thessalonian church and get a paycheck, right? He says here, no, when I was amongst you though, I didn't take a paycheck at that time because I wanted to show you an example of how to work and how to work hard so that I just didn't eat people's bread for naught. See, because he says he did have the power. He had the authority, but he wanted to make himself an example. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So it's a grave sin for somebody to be lazy to the point where they're not working, right? That they're not working, they're just trying to get a free ride, not doing anything at all. This is a grave sin in the Bible. It says here, now that them that are such commanding that they work and eat their own bread, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I just want to make sure I read verse 15 because it's not that when you cast somebody out of the church that you just burn all bridges, right? When somebody's cast out of the church, you, you, you count him as a, not as an enemy, you admonish him as a brother. You, so you, you're throwing them out because if they're not willing to listen to you, this is like a last resort. You know, it's like if you're not going to listen, you know, th this, is, this is a punishment that you have to have. But we want you to get right. But what I'm showing you here is that people that are lazy, you know, and I can imagine in the days of the Thessalonian church that people aren't working and, you know, they come to church, you know, there's the daily ministration of food. They just want a free ride, right? They're not working. They're able. They're able to work. They're able to get a job, but they're just at church busybodies meeting with the church eating free food all the time he's saying if there's somebody like that note that man and have no company with him so you know we have that list in first corinthians where you know there's sins that people get thrown out for but laziness as well if you're not working and you can work and you're trying to get a free ride that can get somebody thrown out of church too right so laziness is not um is a is a, is a grave sin so a hard worker Four traits of a faithful man. Faithfulness. Your appearance. Look like a man. You're a hard worker. And the last one I just want to touch on. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 11. The last one I want to touch on is if you are a faithful man, if you're a godly man, you will be a leader. Right? You will be a leader. Now, what does it mean? What, what is a good leader? What makes a good godly leader? Because you, you go out there and you, you have, like I talked at, at the beginning, you've got the world standard of manliness, right? Where, you know, the lead, you know, you got Steve Jobs as a leader or whatever. And, and obviously they'll have certain attributes of what makes a strong leader. But what makes a godly leader, right? But just because just they're a leader in a, in a corporation, that doesn't make them an example that you want to follow. That, that doesn't make them a godly example. What makes a godly, faithful leader in Christianity, right, in the church? Look at what Paul says. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So a good follower, a good godly follower is a good, sorry, a good godly leader, as Paul, we can all assure, is, right? A good godly leader is a good godly follower. So if you say, I don't know how to be a leader, I don't know how to be this great leader, just be a great follower. All you have to do is just be a great follower of Jesus Christ and then you can say to people, follow me even as I am of Christ, right? And then you'll be a leader because you're following Jesus Christ. So we all follow Christ and if you follow Christ closer, you're going to be in front, right? That's the leader. The closer you are to Jesus, then you're out in front. You're the leader. So a good leader is somebody that is following Jesus Christ. If you're wondering, how do I be a good godly leader? Be a good godly follower. Um, now, God made the man to be a leader. God, gave, God made the man to be the leader, not the woman, right? That's why I'm talking about four traits 
of being a faithful man, right? So don't, like, a woman is not like, oh, I've got to be the leader, right? Like, you know, Victor preached on being a leader today, I've got to lead my, my, my family. No, no, the husband leads the family. You're, you're the follower. You follow your husband. Um, and that's how you lead other women, right? You lead that example by being a godly woman and following your husband, right? That's, that's how you be a leader in that aspect. But for a man, you ought to be leading your wife, right? You ought to be leading in every area of your life as, if you can, you know, if that's, if that's your place in, in that circle. You don't have to get too far in your Bible to realize that this is the purpose that God had created for man, right? To be a leader. Look at Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Right? That's not popular these days, but th that's what the Bible taught all the way from Genesis. I mean, you only have to get into the third chapter of your Bible and you realize that that was God's ordination for the family, that the husband would be the leader. Um, now, this is alluded to in 1 Timothy 2. Um, it says here in 1 Timothy 2, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. Now, we discussed this a bit in the WhatsApp group. I'm not going to go into this, but obviously in this place, you know, women are not meant to preach. They're not meant to teach. I don't even think women should say amen. You know, you, there's something that I say that you agree with. You should refrain from saying amen because the Bible says that you learn in silence, right? So I, he says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Look at this. Why? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So we see here that Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, even writing about men leading in church, right? Because we're talking about men need to be leaders. They lead in church. They lead in the family. And he actually goes back to Genesis where Adam was first formed and Adam was put in charge. Um, let's uh, look here in uh, uh, 1 Timothy. Oh, I won't go to that one. I've already made the point that in church men should be leaders. Um, let's go to Ephesians 5. I'll just show you this one. Men should be leaders in the family as well. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So just making the point clear that God made the man to be a leader, right? So um, that's something that a man ought to be working on, is to, to be a leader. Now, One thing somebody might ask, and I'll just sort of end on this point before I finish up. It's clear in the Bible that man should be a leader, right? And if you want to be a good leader, you're a good, good follower of Jesus Christ. But um, one, one, this one point I just want to touch on is people might ask, you know, well, how do I get people to follow me? You know, if you're a husband and you say, well, how do I, how do I get my wife to follow me? She's not obeying Ephesians 5, right? <laughs> like, she's not just doing whatever I wanted to do. Like, how do, how do I, you know, because obviously if you try and force somebody to follow you, they won't necessarily, you can't force somebody to do that, right? So whilst you should be a leader, and whilst it doesn't justify people not following you, right? It's kind of like in this church, right? I've got authority in this church, and if I say something and somebody doesn't do it, you know, I can say that they're in the wrong, right? Because I've asked them to do something, or I've asked them to do something within the church, and they don't do it. But even though they're wrong, it doesn't justify what they're doing. As a leader, how do I get that person to want to do it? How do I get that person to want to follow, right? So when you think about, you know, well, I know the Bible says that my wife should follow me, but she's not obeying that. Like, how do I get my wife? To, how do I get people to follow me? So a couple of thoughts here. You know, if you want to be a leader, you want people to follow you. Number one is, you know, be somebody worth following, right? So if you want, if you want to be a leader, and you want people to follow you, why don't you, instead of complaining all the time that people don't follow you or your wife doesn't do what she's told, why don't you work on being somebody worth following? You know, be, be a leader and then your wife might want to follow you, right? So be in front. If you want to be a leader, you need to be in front, right? So you want your wife to follow you. Does she even have anything to follow? Right? So you want to be a leader. You want her to follow you. Like have something for her to follow. You need to be in front. Wait. Guys, guys, sorry. They keep playing, playing around. So be somebody worth following, right? So um, you need to be in front. If you want to lead somebody, you need to be in front of them. So just think about things like that. What are some other qualities? Take a stand. 
take a stand. You know, are you even taking a stand on things? Are you making decisions? If you want her to follow your decisions, are you even making decisions for her to follow, right? Sorry, man. Come on. I don't want to have to, I don't want to, have to spank you within my preaching, all right? Okay, just sit quietly. Um, make decisions. If you make a decision, then there's something to follow. Um, another reason, another thing to think about is, you know, if your wife's not willing to follow you and you think about somebody worth following, be somebody worth following. Be, like, take care of things around the house in the sense that, you know, sometimes husbands just let their wives do everything, right? They just let their wives do anything and they, you know, you know the wife is taking care of all the bills, the wife is taking care of everything and they just get home, they do nothing, they just sit on the couch and they just want to watch sport. I mean, what sort, of pers- what, what sort of person is that to follow if that's um, all you've got to offer your wife? You know, you don't want to just be this useless bank account to her. You want to take care of your family, get things done. Like, yeah, I, I understand there are things for a woman to do, but that doesn't mean that you just let her do, like, let her do everything. Like in my house, for example, like I take care of the finances and things like that because I don't want to trouble my wife with all those things. So I help around so she knows that we're pulling equal weight, right? And then it's not just, she just feels like she's just doing everything and has no respect for me. Um, what about spiritually, right? If you want to lead your wife spiritually, if you want to lead your wife spiritually, uh, then you need to be in front. If your wife, like, think about this, right? If your wife is more of a mature Christian than you are, then, then how, how are you leading her, right? If your wife is more of a mature Christian than you are. I mean, think about this. If your wife has read more Bible and knows more doctrine than you, shame on you, right? Shame on you as a man. Like, if, if, if my wife knew more Bible than me and read more Bible than me, I mean, how, can, how am I leading my family in that aspect? How am I leading my family spiritually so just a couple of things to think about there if you want to be a leader yes i understand that followers are commanded to follow the god-ordained leader in their life but if your followers are not following you you need to ask the question am i even a leader worth following right and if i'm a leader worth following you may not have as much trouble getting them to obey their side of the equation which is to be the follower so anyways, I hope that was helpful for you, uh, sort of encouraged and provoked the men in here. You know, we want to be faithful men, right? We want to show ourselves a man. And what are the four attributes I've talked about today? Faithfulness, appearance, hard worker, and you're striving to be a leader. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. I, I just um, thank you for your word. Thank you that you give us clear instruction on how to be a leader. And I pray, Lord, that you will help each and every one here to, um, uh, to be a leader in their own right. You know, whether we're a man or whether we're a woman, pray the Lord that we'll be uh, godly examples to one another. But Lord, especially as men, I pray that, Lord, we'll be in front, we'll be leading the charge. Help us to be faithful men. And uh, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.